active speakers, you know, it's an active speaker. What were we thinking, <laughs> right? Yeah. If you, if you think only about traditional audiophiles, no one's really made success of doing active speakers for long. Um, they try it, it disappears. Yeah. Studios, try going into a studio that isn't using a set of active speakers. You know, maybe 80%, I, I don't know the exact figure, but awful load of studios all use active speakers these days. But we don't on our side. And the only company that has continued to be successful with active speakers really is Meridian. Hmm. Uh, as part of their complete system and their ways of developing new uh, digital circuitry and you know, MQA and everything that they do, it's all targeted towards a system approach. And you could say it's more like a British Bang & Olufsen in terms of who they are now. Um, yeah. Actually, Pat just reminded me, we talked about speaker directivity and, and uh, you know, the experiments I did in a room. Um, the latest Bang & Olufsen speakers, you know that really odd looking thing that looks like a, <laughs> a sack of potatoes, but <laughs> you know the one I mean? What uh, generate, like very new or is this in the last couple of years? The last couple of years, they've done that really odd looking thing, which has got lots of drivers facing in different directions, all yeah. under DSP control. That is something that addresses room acoustics by being able to send sounds in specific directions to cancel certain reflections and to modify what you hear of the room. Uh, mm. That was done as a result of ultimately all of that work we did in that anechoic chamber of uh, knowing and trying to understand room reflections. So that's, that was interesting. Yeah. And of course that's fully active, but it was just that connection calling it the British Bang & Olufsen. So why hasn't, um, why haven't active speakers been really successful? Well, the first thing is audifiers like choice. If, you, if you're a DIYer, a lot of DIYers understand with modern day DSP and some uh, multi-channel amplifier, they can create the speaker that they want. And they wonder why some people are still doing passive speakers. Well, we do passive speakers because uh, audiophiles want their choice of power amplifier, of pre-amplifier, of DAC, yeah. of turntable, cables, everything. And an active speaker limits your choice. And obviously the first choice with a power amplifier, do I want a tube amplifier or solid state? Then if I choose solid state, well, I do, do I want class AB? Do I want pure class A? Yep. Do I want the switching amplifier? Which in the old days people would know. <laughs> of course yep. I don't want the switching amplifier. Now it's a viable choice. Um, so why would we do this? And the other factor with um, audiophiles, and this touches on the business that you told me you do. Um, trading and trade up. Very, it's very rare that you go out and spend $100,000 on a complete system and then you, you're done, you're happy. It's your last ever system. You, if you have a $100,000 system, you got there through years of trading up. So your product has to have trading value and you have to have a path to getting to that higher system. So if, you've, if you want to move from a passive speaker and your power amplifier to an active speaker, you're not trading in just your speaker, you're trading in your power amplifier. So it's a, it's a double hit in trying to, a barrier in trying to move upwards to an active speaker. So there's a number of reasons it hasn't worked. But as an engineer, it's absolutely sort of the right thing to do. There's so many advantages, particularly at any given price point, you can gain by going to an active speaker. So let's discuss what those are, and then let's discuss how you get around that image of what an active speaker is. So Thanks. let's talk about a passive speaker with an amplifier. Yep. In order for those, they need to be universal, universally compatible. So the amplifier has to have a, basically a flat response, a linear response. The speaker from a linear input response has to have a linear flat response output. It also has to have sufficient sensitivity that it'll work with 
a reasonable range of amplifier powers. You know, it can't be an 80 dB sensitivity speaker. It can't even be necessarily 100 dB sensitivity because any noise in the amplifier, in the power amplifier after the gain control, you'll just hear hiss from the speakers. So you've got a natural range of speaker sensitivities you can cope with and a reasonable range of amplifier powers. But they also have to be able to, the amplifier has to be able to drive the speaker. I know it was popular in the 70s and 80s to have speakers whose impedance dropped down so low that you needed a huge Krell or something with huge current capability just to drive it. That was my view through inept engineering, but <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. So, but you still need this compatibility. So what now if we go to an active speaker? What, what do we get? Well, first of all, you got a speaker directly connected to the drive unit. So typically the impedance that it sees is much more controlled. It's just the driver impedance. Now that's not flat, but it's very better behaved than often happens when you stick a crossover in the way. So that's one advantage. Um, secondly, because the signal the amplifier is seeing is pre-filtered, um, it's, it's a base amplifier, or it's a mid-range amplifier, or it's a tweeter amplifier, then it's operating over a limited bandwidth. So it's not as subject to intermodulation distortion. Um, and then also from a time, uh, a temporal characteristic, music varies through time. It's peaks and dips and peak, let's say a cymbal crash, lots of high, en high frequency energy, but momentarily uh, very little continuous energy. In, a, in the bass region, a bass guitar has got a lot more average power compared to peak power. So it changes with frequency range. It also changes as you narrow the bandwidth going into an amplifier. You, the more you narrow it, the, the closer the peak to mean ratio becomes. So you can play tricks in the amplifier design to pick them that specifically match to that frequency range and to that temporal characteristic. Hmm. So, and then on top of that, since not all drivers in a system are equal sensitivity, the woofer is always going to be the lowest sensitivity and will set the system sensitivity. The mid range will be typically higher and you pad it down in the crossover to match the bass driver. Ditto with the tweeter. Um, so the amplifier has got to have sufficient voltage swing and yet you're padding it down in the crossover. If you're driving an each from the own amplifier, the tweeter only needs an average power of at most 10 watts before it would burn out. It has to have high peaks, but no continuous power. Mid range, a bit more continuous and bass even more. Yeah. So you can have a, as in the Navis, a 40 watt peak amplifier on the tweeter, 100 watts on the mid range, 160 watts on the woofer. They're matched to the driver native sensitivities. So you've got all these things going on and then you can EQ it. And a perfect <laughs> example of the advantages you get from EQing is think of subwoofers, modern day subwoofers. Well, first let's think of the old days. Subwoofers to get down to 20 hertz were huge. They were literally coffin size. Yeah. And that's because the law of physics requires, if you want base extension and reasonable sensitivity, it has to be a big box. There is no way around that. Um, so, and since amplifier power was limited in those days, then you had to have a decent sensitivity and then to get the 20 hertz response, a huge box. What do we do these days? We've got these tiny little subwoofers. How do we get around the physics? We just pump a lot of power. Power is cheap these days. Mm -hmm. So we have a speaker that naturally has no bass. We design it with enough movement to give it bass. If only we could put enough power in to make it move when it's constrained by such a small box. So that's all modern subwoofers are huge drivers with huge magnets, with huge voice coils, huge amplifiers, tiny boxes. We cheat. We EQ it yeah. to get a response. So what can we do in an active speaker? 
we can make the Navis have a small dedicated base driver, relatively small, but with good movement, with good power, with EQ, we can get a surprising amount of bass from a compact speaker. So from an engineering point of view, you can put a lot into that Navis speaker. So let's look now what we have in other active powered speakers these days. They tend to all have DSP crossovers in, right? Digital inputs, if they have an analog input, you have, you have gone through an analog to digital converter. Right. Why do we use DSP crossovers? Because DSP has so much more you can do with it than certainly a passive crossover. It's very difficult designing passive crossovers, the interaction with the drivers and everything. Yeah. Uh, analog active crossovers are easier to design. We can do a few more things that we can't do passively, but we can't do anywhere near what we can with DSP crossovers. Plus DSP crossovers, you can think of something and program it in, push a button, start listening to it. In production, if you need to make changes, it's a software update. There are no component tolerances. Right. So seems a fantastic idea. Why didn't I do that? Because Navis is a traditional active, you know, analog active crossover. Well, one argument is if you need to do all that trickery with uh, a DSP crossover, you kind of didn't design the drivers right in the first place. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I like to antagonize other people by saying that. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a ring of truth in that. Yeah. Uh, and if you build in uh, DSP, so now with, say it's Navis, three-way, you need three digital to analog converters along with the three power amplifiers. Then you need a, a analog to digital converter if you want analog source. If you've got a turntable, it's got to get digitized in, in the speaker. And when you're thinking with all these modern pressings, mm -hmm. the, the, the boom in listening to vinyl, coming a lot of them come from digital sources. So you've taken your analog original music, you've digitized it, you convert yep. it back to analog to, to cut the record. Then you're converting back to digital in the speakers and the DSP, and then finally back to that's obtuse. That's yes. Yeah. So let's try and make it analog. So um, if you if you had had all the DSP in there, basically when we were talking about choice for a traditional audio file, you've now zero choice because literally everything is built in, including the streaming. You take something like the Kefeles 50W, which is really a brilliant speaker. It's beautifully built, beautifully engineered, followed the rules that you'd want to do if you're designing a concentric speaker. Yeah. Um, brilliant. But it is a complete system. So, of course, a traditional audiophile wouldn't want to use that in a prime system. They might use it in a secondary system. Yep. Um, and of course you can't ever upgrade the sound. You're stuck with what you bought because it's all built in. Yeah. So we thought let's not, we want to meet the market for the people who are not interested in being a traditional audiophile in picking and choosing. They're used to plugging a pair of speakers into a computer. Um, they want connectivity. That's what the LS50W targets. We wanted to meet the needs of those people, but we also wanted to try and meet the needs of the audiophile. So let's make it all analog, but build in a uh, receiver module for wireless capability. So that's the only sort of digital part of it. That yeah. wireless receiver converts back to analog to go through the analog circuitry. When we're not using it wireless, we literally switch off power to that module so there's no interference. Nice. It can either be a connected, by having our Discovery Connect, that's a module that has three wireless transmission paths. Limited to 1644 for reasons of stability of connection. But that transmits left center subwoofer, so you can add a wireless subwoofer. Input, it will take uh, pretty much any digital source, convert it to that wireless transmission and connect it. So it's you know, Spotify Connect, AirPlay, Bluetooth, um, Rune is a Rune endpoint. Nice. Things. So um, you can connect your phone to it. You can connect whatever other sources you've got. 
hide it in the cupboard, and then connect wirelessly. So now it meets both worlds. So now how do I interest audio files in it? So first of all, by playing it to them and showing just how good it sounds, and then head off the first question. Yeah, but I've <laughs> lost it. <laughs> yeah. So how, how do you head off that question? Because I played it to a number of audiophile societies now, and a lot of the aging audiophiles have come and go, I love the sound. I can't believe the sound. From that. That's fantastic sound. And they go, you know, I'm looking to um, simplify my life. I'm getting older. I've had my fun being an audiophile. Yeah. And I want to have a simpler system, but I know what sound quality I still want to get. This meets that need. So it's working. Um, and the argument to suggest why it can work for you when I'm taking away your choice, you know, I'll never get around the fact that it's not a tube amplifier in there, right? So we'll write, we'll write off those people. Yes, those people, not for you. Not for me. But on the other hand, you can say, yeah, but you could use a tube preamplifier and maybe then you're still very happy, okay? So we can maybe not fully write off. Um, so now, how do we get around the fact that you've lost a bit of choice? Well, first we say, yes, but think of the price point. Think of the sound you can get to that price point that I could not have given you or you could have not built for yourself uh, from a traditional passive system. Yeah. Now let's take that argument a bit further. Let's say you've got a traditional passive system and you're thinking of buying one of my passive speakers. So I had total control of how I designed that speaker. I made every single choice of tweeter, mid-range, woofer, crossover components, crossover complexity, cabinet, everything. I took every bit of choice away from you of what that speaker will be, right? Of course I did because I'm designing the speaker, right? Yeah. Listen to it and you go, oh, I like that speaker or, oh no, I prefer BMW or Kef or whatever. You don't ha at that moment then say, yeah, but Andrew, what if you used a Dyn Audio tweeter in there? Right. Or Peerless or whatever. A, a, a DIYer might, but the normal customer never goes that far. They stop at the input terminals to the box. Yeah. What I'm saying, I've just sort of moved the terminals where you stop a bit further inside and dragged that power amplifier yeah. inside. And yes, you might just, just stop, stop questioning it. Stop thinking, well, what if it have used a class A amplifier in there? Or, well, what the hell do you know about designing amplifiers? I don't have to. I know a bit. I have an identical twin brother who has designed the benchmark amplifier. You know, he knows a thing or two about amplifiers. Sure. Or I have a Peter Madnick. I find somebody who does know about electronics to put in there, right? Um, but you've still got every other bit of choice. The, the cables going from the preamp, the cables going, the power cord to the preamp, the choice of preamp, the type of preamp, the DAC, everything else. And I haven't digitized your analog source. Um, so just step back slightly and go, yeah, you know what? That's right. I've got every other one of my choices. And if I choose that speaker, I've got something that I could never have achieved sound quality wise by having a passive crossover and a universal amplifier. Yeah. When they look at it that way, you go, yeah, okay, I won't win everybody, but I think I'm going to win over a lot of other people. And then if I need to, you go, yeah, well, you know, most of the recordings you're listening to were monitored on active speakers in the studio. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think what we've seen is uh, maybe folks getting into Navis bookshelves for a secondary system. Yes. Then really being won over, you know, that, that, 
okay, there's some, there's some truth here. And is my listening experience still great? Like you said, I still can manage some of my other components and indulge my hobby, but uh, at a little lower scale of both mental investment, financial investment, um, you know, they might start with that for a secondary system. And then yeah. that thinking kind of starts to encroach, you know, maybe on their, on their main listening system. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's that's awesome. I, we uh, we use the Navis in in our office at at TMR. That's kind of our our daily um, for some of the office staff. And then we have a, a listening room where we've been uh, really actively demoing Karina over the last month. And that's where I think a lot of uh, the TMR staff's really been been won over by what a great sound. And we've we've tried everything from you know giant vintage speakers you know so to have small bookshelves in the room is is an interesting thing with a, a stack of you know very expensive complete electronics behind it but those those speakers absolutely sing uh especially for their size and price yeah and one, one of the things i had to make sure of in developing the electronics that are in it that they are sufficiently transparent mm -hmm. that as you upgrade all those other components you still have a choice over yeah. Then hear uh, those improvements. Uh, now, of course, over the digital, over the wireless path, it's not ever going to sound as good through the analog path um, because it's a wireless transmission path. Right. It's, it's surprisingly good for the fact that it's wireless, and for those people who want wireless, their expectations of what quality level they will get are perhaps not as high. Yeah. But it's still very enjoyable to listen over wireless, but I'm not going to pretend that that's the absolute quality level that you could get through all the other paths of doing it separate. Do, do you guys see that as a, an area of future innovation? I assume that's a place where technology will continue to push forward and true wireless will just wireless, get getting better and better, right? Wireless is definitely getting better and better. The, the difficulty uh, so far is if you want to have, um, let, let's say 24192. Yep. It's very difficult to broadcast that stably and through walls yeah. uh, without dropouts. And you don't want to get a product that won't connect. You know, this is the problem. Uh, whenever I think back to traditional audiophile approach and the turntable, yeah. it works every time you drop the, <laughs> the stylus down in the groove. You have music, you have a volume control knob, maybe no. Yeah. No remote control it doesn't it, it's always gonna work and you look at all these digital things and you got to be a computer expert to right. keep it working often so it was very important that it remains stable so limiting it to 1644 was critical um, things will change in the future you know the Weiser initiative is uh, making inroads and yeah. better but I think we still have some way to go to guarantee that stability. And um, we can't start to bring in new listeners and then they go, yeah, well, this, this just doesn't work. I, you know. I agree. The, the computer type digital frustration is just such a turnoff that if, if yes. that part can't be simple and work, you know, if not 100% of the time, 95% of the time without fail, it's just, it's just a compromised user experience. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, guys, this has been amazing. Uh, I love, I think we will probably end up with two different um, presentations of this one, you know, specific to, to Navis. That was a great education and new way of thinking about it for me. So uh, I'm sure our listeners might might also value that the same way. Thoughts, Travis, Andrew, before we wrap up? Um, I was very happy to be able to do this. I wish I'd have been there in person, um, but uh, that's not going to happen for a while by the looks of it. But yep. you know, any time we want to do this kind of stuff, it, it seems to, the format seems to work very well, and I'm, I'm available for anything else to talk about. Awesome. Travis, yeah, I, any, any final thoughts? I would have to completely agree. Um, I think this has been exceptional and I appreciate you and your team being 
uh, so willing to join us today. And uh, it's been a great experiment. So I would encourage us to do this again. Definitely. Awesome. Thank yeah, you. I, I would love to. Um, we'll make sure we we circulate this among our community and, and get you guys engaged in some of the feedback. Uh, perfect timing on the dog as we wrap up here. Um, that wasn't mine. Mine are that, not that big. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's mine. He's uh, 35 pounds and likes to act like he's 135 pounds. So. Guys, thank you so much for the time. We really enjoyed it. Yes, exactly. Virtual handshake to everyone. And we look forward to having you guys in, in the office, uh, you know, as the world regains its sanity here, hopefully in the summer or the fall. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys.